understand. Oh, I don't. I understand it, Margot. It's not the same as liking it. Well, come on, there was nothing ulterior in my motives. I mean, I wasn't uh, going to throw it up to you. It was simply meant to be a gift. Draper, oh, look, at this stage of the game, does it make any sense to reject the gift? We're not going to reject it. What? A couple of weeks ago, I could have, Margot. When I was still being considered for that job in New York, then I, I could have sold that house, and I would have been more than glad to return your money to you. But it wasn't meant to be returned. It's going to be. What? We're not going to sell the house. But, Margo, you're going to get every penny of that $35,000 you put into it. Draper, you don't have to do that. You know, it's going to take us a long time to get all that money together, April. Oh. Oh, Draper, for heaven's sake. All right. All right. If you want to look on it as a, a debt, I suppose I can't stop you. You're not you going to stop me, Margo. And I'm going to pay you back that money if I have to work night and day for the rest of my life. What'd you get for some more champagne? Well, I never say no to champagne. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. This is such a good idea. Why didn't you think of this before? No, oh, well, it was my wife's inspiration. Oh. Yeah, she was despairing of us ever having a <coughs> private dinner. Uh -huh. Oh, look what I did. <laughs> no, and, not for uh, you. <laughs> right, so she suggested that we have a table in here in my office. It's quite a good idea. Oh, now, look what oh. happened. The well has run dry. We can't have that, can we? <laughs> no, we certainly can't have that. Yes, Mr. Dorn? Oh, yes, sir. Right away. Good evening. Scotch and water, please. Uh, water outside. not nice. I drink scotch and you drink champagne. Well, this is for a good customer. A very good customer. Excuse me. Oh, hurry back. I don't take long. Care for another? I would care very much for another. Another drink. Another life. Another face. There's nothing wrong with the face you've got. Uh, I just had it too long, that's all. Some faces improve with age. Like some whiskey. Mm, I'm beginning to like the unicorn. <laughs> What's your name? I don't drink with strangers. The name's Mickey. As in mouse? <laughs> well, some people think as in rat. Oh, no, I don't believe that, Mickey. All bartenders have great souls. That's why they chose their profession. Because they know they're helping people. <laughs> like doctors. Well, if I were a doctor, ma'am, I'd tell you that was the wrong way to treat yourself. You drink that fast, you usually end up drinking too much. As they used to say in gas stations, fill her up. Why don't we wait just a little while for the next one, okay? Are you suggesting I have a drinking problem? <laughs> hey, you got the money to pay. You got no problem. Just uh, try to stay on the stool, okay? I got kind of a bad back, and uh, I'd hate to have to pick you up off the floor. Mickey. Can I ask you something? Sure. Do I look familiar to you? Have you seen my face before? No. No, of course not. You're too young, aren't you? Too young for what? Uh-oh. What is it? There's a face I think I have seen before. Dawn here this evening. Oh, I'm sorry, miss. I think he's gone home already. 
Are you sure? Well, I'm pretty positive. Would you like to leave a message for him? Well, he told me he was here almost every evening. Well, you know, sometimes he goes home early. Could I get you a drink? Oh, all right. I'll have a gin and it, please. Pardon? Gin and it? You must be English. What of it? Uh, okay, I'll take a gin and tonic, please. You got it. I made a movie in England. I made two movies in England. Did you know I made a movie that Sir Lawrence, um, Lord Olivier, was going to be in? Yes, he was going to be my co-star. <laughs> Can you imagine that? But he changed his mind. Or something. Are you sure that Elliot isn't here? Uh, did he say he was going home? Look, miss, I just work here. Um, let me introduce myself. My name is Nola Patterson. Oh, oh look what you did to my dress, you, so you rummy. Which way is the powder room? Right over there, miss. Charlottetown is next on CBC. Sunday Nights brings you the very best in family entertainment this fall. We are the CBC with Super Special and a Gift to Last, both returning September the 23rd. From the sparkling variety of our Super Specials to the warmth you'll share with the Sturg Sturgis family, we are the CBC for you this fall. <laughs> CBC Toronto, Channel 5, Cable 6. You know, my stepmother thinks you'd make perfect movie material, Mr. Dorn. A wonderful matinee idol. <laughs> How very kind. I don't know if I agree with her. I think leading men today are much more ordinary looking. Oh, hey, that's terrific. Looks like I get a shot at it. <laughs> Have you ever acted professionally? No, Miss Madison, not on a stage. Um, although there was a time when I was um, sort of an actor. Hey, I remember that. That's when you were uh, running the Children of the Earth thing, wasn't it? Oh, but that's, that's a long story. I'm sure Mr. Dorn would like to put that way, way behind it. Yeah, that's quite right. Well, I'll uh, stand to my present business. I um, yeah. hope you enjoy the evening. I'll send a waitress over with me. Thank you. Ah, well, we haven't drunk a toast yet. Oh, that's right. What shall we drink to? Mm, how about um, Calvin's Lake? Yeah, that's nice. Here's to Calvin's leg. So I, uh, I reach for mine. Elliot, can I use your telephone? Sure, go ahead. Miss Madison, are you all right? I'm, I'm all right, but I'm scared as hell. God. Thank God we saw this madman in time. But Stephen, I was sitting here drinking a toast, and then he pulled me to the floor, and then... That was pretty quick thinking, Mickey. This is Steve Guthrie. I guess I meant the unicorn. No. No, everybody's all right. Uh-huh. As quickly as possible, thank you. Oh, and you don't know what this means to me. I hate to hear you say what you did. 
It's almost like hearing you swear. I, I love you. But I do love you, Noah. You're my wife. But do you really mean it? You are going to make this movie. Well, we'll go into production. That's as much as I, prom I can promise. But I can't swear that we're ever going to finish it. Well, you heard what Eddie said about the curse on this movie. Oh, I don't believe that. Do you? <laughs> I think Eddie just made the whole thing up. To make it sound more dramatic. It's just like him. Well, he didn't make up the fact that both leading ladies died during the production. <laughs> well, I doubt very much that that was the, the ghost of Hester Atherton that made that happen. Poor Susan had a heart problem for years. And as for Myrna Davenport, <laughs> it wasn't a witch that killed her, darling. It was pure alcohol. Owen... Is that why you've been so hesitant about this? The curse? No, my particular curse, alcohol. Did you think I'd let that interfere with the shooting? It occurred to me, yes. Oh, God knows you've had enough trouble with drunken leading ladies and men. But I swear to you, Owen... I won't touch one drop when we do this. I, I mean it. Not a drop. Same old promise, no? Just a different reason this time. No, no, I swear. A different promise. One that I'll keep. Oh, you know the main reason I drank. Because it killed my worst enemy, time. I know that you need the work. God knows I do. Yes, it's true, darling. You've spent so much time just worrying about your miserable family. Brian running away from home. Paige and her terrible friends. And me, of course. I've been your worst problem. Well, doubt if we'll solve all our problems with this uh, family project. But look how much fun it's going to be. All of us working together. Well, I, I don't know if that's going to be possible. I mean, I don't know whether Paige is going to want to make her acting debut in Mansion of the Damned. Oh, but you've always wanted her to have a film career. Oh, I wanted her to be happy. And one time I thought that was the way to do it. Well, things happen, as you very well know. Well, I think it'll change her completely. Take her mind off all these ridiculous choruses and silly crushes. Owen, it's a turning point for us. It's a kind of a miracle, I think. If Hester Atherton was a witch, I think she's a very good one. Believe it, Uncle Eddie. You believe that this movie is going to do this family some good? Brian, when are you going to start calling me just plain Eddie? I mean, I feel old enough as it is. But when some ex admiral keeps calling me <laughs> uncle. <laughs> I didn't quite make admiral in the Navy. Brian, I'm not saying that this movie is going to be the cure for everything and everybody, but, well, if it, if it puts your dad back to work and gets your mother out of her sick bed. Who can it hurt? It could hurt both of them, Eddie. What if the movie flopped? Oh, Brian, movies flop all the time. And the world doesn't come to an end. Well, my mother's world could. Eddie, it's been 15 years since my mother set foot in front of a camera. She may expect to see the old Nola Patterson up there on that screen, but she sure won't. That is what you think. She's going to see what she wants to see. And in my uh, unhumble opinion, She's going to give a performance that a lot of people are going to want to see. Yeah. What if she doesn't? What if she can't make it work? What do you think that'll do to her? What the hell do you want, kid? You want a gold-plated guarantee? You want a life without risks, without any chances? <laughs> no wonder you didn't make Admiral. <laughs> Say, uh, <laughs> can I help myself to the booze? Sure. Make yourself at home. You're practically a member of the household anyway, at least... That's what Dad keeps on saying. Thanks. Matter of fact, you almost were a member of this family, weren't you? What do you mean? I mean, I might just be calling you Dad instead of Uncle Eddie. 
Now, who ever gave you an idea like that? Oh, you know, kids always hear more than they're supposed to. And the one thing I remember hearing when I was, uh, oh, about 11 or 12, was the fact that you were supposed to be in love with my mother. Ah, <laughs> oh, come on now. Who wasn't in love with Nola Patterson in those days? You know, she used to get two, three thousand letters a week. She used to get 40 or 50 proposals of marriage every month. Did she ever get one from you? Brian, I was always crazy about your mom. But Owen is the lucky stiff who got her, and... Okay, fine. Because I like him, too. But I still think enough of your old lady to want to see her back on her feet again. You know what I mean? Yeah. I know. Then help me, will you, kid? You love her, too, right? Help me make this damn thing work. It's just going to be insane. Oh, oh, thank you. We have 15 towns in five days. We're not going to have time to pack or unpack. That is a wild schedule. What do you do, Logan? Do you make the same speech in every city? Yeah, about the same. I have to remember the name of the place, though. Yeah. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, can't tell you what a pleasure it is being back in good old uh, Chicken Falls. <laughs> Chicken uh, Falls? Uh, my campaign's manager says we regionalize the speech after the opening. Oh, and how exactly do you regionalize it? Well, if we're in some suburb where the crime rate is zilch, I can't really scream at them about putting all their crooks behind bars. Well, what, well, what the hell do you say? Oh, something like, uh... Well, folks, you've got a nice, peaceful little community here in... Uh, uh, the Chicken Falls. Chicken Falls, <laughs> right? Now... You don't want a lot of hoodlums coming up from Monticello and ravishing your banks and robbing your women, do you? Now, if you don't want the Monticello bad guys up here, you know what you got to do. You got to elect a strong district attorney. You're going to put them someplace where they can't do the God-fearing people of Chicken Falls any harm. That's a wonderful speech, and I will vote for you in a second. By the way, what are you going to do with Jamie while you're away? Is that the lady with me, Mrs. Uh... Mrs. Harris? She said she'd take him for three days. Well, what are you going to do with the other two? Well, I hope she'll take him the other two, but if she doesn't, I guess she may just have to take him to her place, and God knows what that's like. Mm. Yeah, I'm not too crazy about that idea myself, leaving him alone in a strange house. Well, uh, too bad uh, you're doing most of your traveling during the week. I'd love to have him for a couple of days, you know, over the weekend or something. You know, it's really a shame you can't take some time off. Draper says you've been working off and hard. Well, Margo's been after her to take some time off. Um, stop her from working those 16-hour days. Whoa, look who's talking. Draper has worked later than me, excuse me, later than I, uh, almost every night this whole week. Well, I still wish we could take him on the campaign tour. Then I wouldn't have to make any speeches at all. Just hold him up, show him to the audience, and say, any man with a child like this deserves your vote, right? Mm -hmm. right. Don't be silly. Hey, look, is there any chance you could take him over? No, there's not a chance going to be bad enough with all the traveling. Can you imagine packing 500 diapers? Mm, yeah, it does sound a little impractical. Maybe the other, di other idea isn't so bad, though, huh? What idea? Well, uh, taking a couple days off. Are you serious? Would you really consider taking him? Well, you said that uh, Mrs. Harris can take him for three days, right? And, yeah. Well, there is a holiday coming up, so I have some time coming to me. Uh, what do you think, Draper? That would be terrific. Mm -hmm. Do you hear that? Well, it would sure be great as far as I'm concerned. The thing that's been worrying me the most about this campaign tour is whether or not I can trust Mrs. Harris. Well, look, I do have to talk to Margot first. Well, I don't think Margot's going to give you a hard time. But I think what she had in mind was a uh, vacation. Oh, well, now, listen, we don't want to foul up any vacation plans, you guys. Oh, wishful thinking. Draper's idea of a vacation these days is not working on Sunday. You think I've been eager about work? I should check out my husband here. Yeah, he told me he's got to make his fortune now so he can pay... Pay his fuel bills this winter. Yeah, they're going to be something, too. I hope our apartment is warm this winter. I catch cold so easy. As a matter of fact, you know, I think I'm getting one right now. Yeah, you didn't tell me about that. Yeah, yeah. Do you have a mm -hmm. tissue? Uh huh. Oh, I'm sorry. Right up there. Oh, thanks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, Logan, 
You are going to win this election, I know, because the man that is running against you is so unattractive. It's not a beauty contest, Raven. Well, I know, I know. But you're going to win anyway. <laughs> well, I think you can count on four votes here anyway. Well, you'd have five if Jamie could vote, but he seems to be getting a little sleepy. You think maybe we could bring him upstairs? Yeah. yeah. I guess it is time to put him to bed. I told Logan he would just be in the way if he were up. Well, no, not at all. I love having him, but it is getting late. Must be past your bedtime. Okay. Okay. Oh, thank Come you. Come on, time to go to bed. Yeah. Heavy. Have a little adult conversation around here. It's the trouble with having a kid. They always get all the attention. Oh. Did you get you back? Did you talk to Raven yet about, uh, you know, adopting Jamie legally? No, I haven't had a chance. I hadn't seen her since I talked to you at lunch today. I came right here, met her here. Might be a good time to bring it up. I mean, I don't have the papers with me, but uh, I could get the ball rolling. Sure. Is something wrong? No, no. There's not going to be any objection, is there? I mean, you know, considering the fact that you are Jamie's legal father. I mean, natural father. I don't know why she would object. Like you say, it's just a formality. Right. All right, all right, you got me. I'm thinking about something else. Something that happened today at the restaurant after you left. You I know, you forgot your money and couldn't pay the bill. Don't I wish. No, this woman came over and sat down at the table. I'd never seen her before. She had uh, an accent, English, I think. What'd she want? She wanted to tell me something. Didn't stay long, just a minute or two, just long enough to tell me to keep an eye on my wife. What? That was all. No details, no accusations, just keep an eye on Raven. Said she was doing things that I would not like. The implication was very clear. It's a crank, Logan. You're DA. I mean, you deal with these people all the time, every hour on the hour. Oh, yeah. I deal with cranks every day at the office. Not very often in restaurants. Just don't waste any time thinking about it. Yes, right. April was right. Fell asleep the minute he hit the bed. Ah, drat. <laughs> Why the silence? Talking about me, weren't you? You stopped the minute I came in the room. No, as a matter of fact, we were talking about Jamie. Ah, uh, see, I told you. You're lucky you don't have a kid. They get all the attention. Oh, come on, Raven. I wouldn't mind. If I had a baby as cute as Jamie, I'd lavish all my attention on him. We were discussing some legal problems that concern Jamie. Legal? What's legal about a seven-month-old baby? Well, Logan and I were, were talking about Jamie's legal status. It's not as clear as it could be. <laughs> Lawyers. Aren't they awful? Well, they're not all so bad. <laughs> you know, Jamie has only one legal parent. That's you, Raven. Logan thought it would be a good idea if he had a full set. I don't understand what all this is about. Well, I think it would be a good idea if I adopted Jamie. Make sure that he has all his legal rights. Well, what kind of legal rights are you talking about? Want him to be able to inherit my vast fortune if I'm run over by a truck. Gotcha. Stuff like that. You know, it's just a formality. It's the kind of stuff that a lawyer would be concerned about. It's okay with you, isn't it? Sure. Why shouldn't it be? happened all over again, didn't it? Somebody, somebody else tried to kill her, right? Well, you predicted it, Brian. I hope that makes you satisfied. <laughs> Damn it, Steve. Why do you take all these chances no, with her? Oh, no, no, Brian, no. I, I was the one who wanted to go out. I practically insisted Steve take me. But I'm glad. I am so very glad. What can you be glad about almost getting yourself killed, well, Paige? I'm all right. I'm fine. And he's, he's dead. Who? He isn't going to hurt me anymore. Nobody is ever going to hurt me anymore. All right, Paige, it's all right. I want you to calm but down and take it easy. Take it easy, sit down, and I want you to, I Ryan, want you to tell me what happened now. Ryan, we were in the restaurant. Yeah. Let me put it to you this way. We went to the unicorn. A guy named Zach, I guess he maybe he must have followed us over there. 
He pulls a gun and tries to kill your sister. Steve pulled me under the table. I, I don't know how many times we're going to have to say thank you to you. You're going to have to say thank you to the bartender, Mickey Dials. Yeah. It was incredible, Brian. Uh, if it hadn't been for that... The bartender. It's okay, Paige. It's all right. Now, what, what is all this about it being the last time? How do you know that? Paige seems to think that it's over. I know it is. I'm sure of it. I found out from a very, very reliable source. Tobias. Tobias got in touch with her. He warned her about Zack. Said that he was the last assassin. Well, I guess he was right. Zack's dead. Are you all right? Fine. Okay. I have to get back to the unicorn. There are cops all over the place. They'll probably want to ask me some questions. I just wanted to make sure your sister was home safe and sound. I'm safe. I've never been so safe in the last three months. I don't know. All right. I'll talk to you later. Thank you, Steve. Paige, is this for sure? I mean, is it really true? Has your, is your friend Tobias really telling the truth? Yes. I know it is. I know it, it's as true as... I know anything. As well as I know that I love you. Oh, my heart. Brian! Daddy, it's over. It's all over and I'm free. I, you know how wonderful it is to say that I'm really free? I hope so, Paige. I, I really do. It's true. You can believe it. Every, everybody in Tobias's gang is either, it's either dead or running from the police in South America. Well, I'm very happy for you if that's really so. It is. Ask Steve. He'll tell you it's right, the truth. All right, all right. I'll talk to him right now. I don't think you're in any shape to discuss anything. But look, he's at the unicorn answering some oh. questions from the police. And when he comes fine, back... Fine, fine, fine. Okay, all right, that's all right. Now, it's no, we're in no rush now. I just think it's a good idea for you to go upstairs and lie down, all right? Okay. Oh. I should lie down. Oh. Uh, I, I really think that this is a new start for me. I think it could be a new life for all of us. We could all use one, honey. Now, go on. Go on, Spade. Okay. Good night. Good night. What you were doing was wrong, Brian. I wasn't doing anything, Dad. Paige was just telling you what happened. She was doing more than that, Brian. A lot more. And you were just sitting there, letting her believe that you felt the same way. You don't have any idea how I feel. Oh, yes, I do. I've seen your feelings, Brian. I've seen them in your eyes when you look at her. I've seen them every time you touch her. Well, it's got to stop, Brian. The look in your eyes and the touching, it's got to stop right now. Now, is that clear? Excuse me, I think I'll go upstairs. Brian, did you forget? I know it's been three years since I told you, but did you forget what I said? How could I have forgotten? Well, it seems to me that you have from what went on on the sofa. Well, maybe I'd better remind you, Brian. Paige is your sister. She's not your stepsister. She's your flesh and blood sister. Now, for God's sake, Brian, remember that. CBC for 30 from Toronto, coming up next. Next Monday, CBC presents a special journey to the enchanted islands of the Queen Charlotte's with John and Janet Foster. Be a part of Wild Canada next week on CBC.
I've seen that gun before. Watch The Edge of Night weekdays on CBC. The Edge of Night originates with ABC. CBC Toronto, Channel 5, Cable 6. Tell you mine, Steve. Mickey Dial's gun, that's why. That gun saved your life. No matter what you think of Dials, he saved you and your client from an assassin. Yeah, he helped. I know that. With a bullet right through the heart. It's ironic, isn't it? Blames you for the death of his kid brother. But when the chips are down, he shoots the man that wanted to shoot you. Zach was trying to kill Paige, not me. Same difference, Steve. They would have had to get the bodyguard first. What do you know about the gun, Chief? Well, we checked it out. Dials had a permit for it. He got it several months ago. Said he needed it for personal protection, so there was no way it could be denied him. Uh, no, I mean about the gun itself. Did you check the serial number? Do you know its history? Up to a point. What do you mean by that? We found out who the previous owner was. Matter of fact, I have it right here in the report. The previous owner was a man named uh, Barry Lyons. Seems he owns a liquor store. Needed the gun for protection, so he got a license for it. But. The liquor store was robbed, Steve. This gun was one of the items that was taken. Wait a minute. Are you telling me that this is a stolen gun? That's right. But that doesn't necessarily mean that Dials is the one that stole it. Dials claimed that he got this gun from a man by the name of Jones who came into the Unicorn one night. But there's no bill of sale, no receipt. Then that makes it all the more likely. What do you mean? Chief, you know what I think about this gun? I think I've seen this gun before. What? I think that this is the gun that Joey Dials aimed at me the day I shot him. sudden jolt in my mind when I saw this gun at the Unicorn. Well, I know, a lot of guns look alike, and the gun that Joey Dials was carrying, the toy gun, looked very much like the real thing. But we know that gun was a toy. Yes, I know. I still got the damn thing as a souvenir. But I'm telling you something, Chief. This is the gun that Joey Dials turned on me the day I was trying to stop him. Well, then how did the toy gun get into the picture? I don't know. Somebody must have put it there. What? That's it. Somebody must have switched it. But how could that be? You were there, Steve. Yes, but I wasn't there all the time. Neither was Deborah. She was trying to catch this other kid, his, his partner in the crime. Now, after I shot Joy, he fell. Then I heard Deborah cry out. That's right. And you ran to help her. Yeah, and it took us uh, several minutes to subdue the second kid. Now, now, during these several minutes, Joy Dial was lying on the, on the ground with a gun alongside him. Now, somebody in the vicinity could have come along and made the switch. Steve... Are you saying that that somebody is his brother? Mickey was only a few feet away. He was on a fire escape. He saw Joy running down the street with us chasing him. He saw everything. We have that in his statement, that he was on the fire escape. Well, he could have taken the toy gun out of the apartment, down the stairs, and made the switch. I mean, how would it look? A 14-year-old kid carrying a gun. This gun. Things would have been a lot worse on him if his case had gone to court. But Joey was dead. Yeah, but Mickey didn't know that. He did the only thing he could do to protect his brother. He switched the damn guns. Mm -hmm. Steve, if we can prove this, it's not going to be easy. No. We have no eyewitnesses. Maybe you want to try to get Dials down here to headquarters. Maybe I ought to go see Dials myself. I'll talk to you later, Chief. Right. Well, nope. Something is wrong. Something is definitely wrong. I know what it is. You don't look like you're going fishing. You ought to have one of those funny little hats with all the hooks in them. 
The guide will provide everything, Margot. All I have to do is be there. But just don't expect me to bring back a whole batch of fish. It's been years since I dropped a line in water. Oh, don't worry about that, darling. One thing I don't want you to do is bring a whole bucket full of those slimy things for me to put into the freezer. I wouldn't know what to do with them. I don't think Jenny would either. So why am I going? <laughs> Let's just hope I catch something besides a cold, huh? Oh, you better not catch a cold. You better take good care of yourself, as they say. Button up your overcoat. You belong to me. Oh. Darling, I'm going to miss you. Mm, I'm going to miss you. Oh. Well, this is a surprise, April. Yes, perfect timing. One uh, member of the family leaves, another one arrives. Where'd you get that, April? This is Jamie, the future district attorney of Monticello. Oh, isn't he precious? I'm so glad you brought him over. Do you suppose you'd mind if I felt him? Oh, he might, but I, I won't. Oh, oh, he weighs a ton. You got your meat. I had no other choice but to bring him over here. A babysitter can't exactly find assistant babysitters now, can she? I had an idea. I have an assistant babysitter. I told Jenny about this little fellow, and I know she'd love to meet him. Do you mind if I introduce them? Please, go ahead. We shall return. Right, Jenny? So you're uh, babysitting for Raven and Logan, huh? Yeah, I am. I rather like it. I enjoy being with Jamie. Oh. Well, much as I'd like to be part of this domestic bliss, uh, I think I've got to be leaving. I want to try and reach the lodge before night. Margot! What lodge? I'm going fishing, April. Oh, well, what about the unicorn? Who's minding the store? The store is going to be closed for the rest of the week. Didn't you hear about last night? Yes, of course I did. Shooting, was there any damage? Not really. We're closing down to give people a chance to forget. Uh, yes, I suggested that he take a few days off just to relax. I thought it'd be a good opportunity. You're not going with him? Oh, darling, how can I go with him? I can't very well close up the studio, especially when my number one assistant chooses to take care of that darling little boy instead, who has been kidnapped, by the way, by Jenny. She's stuffing him full of milk and cookies. Mm. Oh, he's such an adorable little boy. I know. Okay, Margaret, I think it's time for you to say goodbye to your little boy. Come on. Mm. Goodbye, little boy. Oh. Ah, take care of yourself. Come on. Come on. Bye, April. I want you to call me the minute you get there, so I'll be sure you're all right. Down there. I will. You have a wonderful time, and I love you. And I love you. April? I think there's anything wrong. Margo, I think you're wrong. <laughs> what? I'm sorry. I, look, it's, it's none of my business. And I know I have no right to say it, but I can't help but feel that you are making a terrible mistake with Elliot. Look, I know we we, we talked about it once before. I, I mean, about uh, uh, sharing things together and doing things yeah, together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know we talked about it. Margo, hasn't it ever occurred to you that if you let Elliot go off by himself, that he just might not be doing what he says he's going to do? Go on. Well, do I have to finish it? That's all right. Please, go on. All right. Elliot is a handsome man. I'm, I'm sure there must be temptation. Oh, you mean other women. It's all right, darling. I know. What? Oh, April. I know. particular woman, darling. I, quite frankly, I wouldn't want to know. But you do think that he's seeing another woman? Oh, come on, darling. I can't be naive about this. I mean, that's one of the risks one runs when you marry someone younger than yourself. Oh, look, Elliot and I have always been very rational from the first moment we talked about that. It's a word I hate, you know. Rational and civilized. When one is talking about love, marriage... I didn't realize we were talking about love. But you do love Elliot. You told me you did. Oh, well, that's my misfortune. Come on, Margo. There's no reason for you to have to take this... No, really, darling, please. I've lived a few years longer than you have, you know. I've had a few more relationships like this than you... Well, not exactly like this. 
There was a Tolstoy that said all happy marriages are exactly alike and all unhappy marriages are quite different in their own way. I mean, I'm not saying that Elliot and I are unhappy. We're not. We've made a, a beautiful adjustment to each other. Adjustment, that's another word I hate. Oh, darling, you know your problem. Your problem is you think the world is very neat and orderly. And the heart is shaped. Just like a valentine, but it's not true. The world is a mess. And the heart is a muscle. Marco, you're wrong. The heart... The heart isn't even a part of the body. It's a... Part of the soul. <sighs> April, please, stop it. I can't fool myself on this one issue. I cannot be naive about Elliot. I have to face the fact that he is going to stray. And I can't hold a tight leash on him because if I hold a tight leash on him, he might break it, and if he breaks it, that'll break my heart or whatever you want. Oh, God, that's it. Guess I'm lucky, though. Yeah. I mean, I, uh, I don't have to worry about something like that with my husband. No, you and Draper are quite a different cup of tea. Speaking of which, would you like one? Tea? Yeah. Could you use a drink? <laughs> That's some water. <laughs> That's a great idea, as a matter of fact. I think I will join you. Well, how is my darling Draper? Tired. Very, very tired. Preoccupied. Sorry to hear that. He is very determined to earn a lot of money to pay you back the $35,000. That is very foolish. There, you see, your husband has one negative trait. <clears throat> pride. Foolish, foolish pride. Well, I've thought a lot about it. And I'm not so sure that Draper isn't right. <laughs> about what? Well, Margot, I think I was wrong. I, I think we were both wrong mm -hmm. in keeping from Draper the fact that you put up the $35,000. Of course, at the time, I thought it was the only thing to do, that there was no way that Draper would have accepted that kind of a gift. Darling, it was the only thing to do because there would have been no house otherwise. Margo, I think we should have taken our chances. I believe now that we should have discussed it openly with Draper. There's a chance, a very slight chance, that he might have accepted it if he knew how much it meant to me. Now, you're being naive. He never would have accepted the money, period. He might have. As a loan. Oh. Margo, that's what he considers it now, a loan. The difference is he'd be a lot less bitter. A lot less bitter about, well, about feeling he was deceived. And it's not right to deceive people. But it can be. I mean, if it's for the person's good. No, it's not right for Draper. And it's not right for me. I mean, I'm, I'm upset that I deceived myself into believing that it was for my own good. I, uh, maybe I just better go check on Jane. April? Maybe I, I want to talk to you about something about uh, Draper's job offer. What about? About David Henson. Oh, darling, I feel just awful, but I... I um... <laughs> I should have called him. Uh, I should have called him. I should have called him and told him that Draper is such a wonderful attorney. And maybe it wouldn't have been any good, but at least I would have tried. Marco, it's all right, really. Besides, it uh, doesn't even matter now. bad about Raven. She must be really sick to miss a glamorous trip like this. Fifteen hick towns and five glorious days. And that's why she got sick. <laughs> Just the thought of five days of greasy chicken dinners. It's real nice of you to see me off. Very encouraging. Hey, you're the candidate. You're supposed to love all this. You're supposed to love all the hash houses and the chamber of commerce dinners and the sleazy hotels. The plane's gonna leave any minute now. Where's the rest of the staff? They're already in Center City. I took a later plane because of Raven. Oh, what you got anyway? No, some kind of flu. She had a fever of 102 when I took her temperature. Too bad. I had a company on your trip, but you left me in charge of the whole office. 
Just do me one favor. I don't spend the whole week in the swivel chair playing Let's Pretend. Me? Mm -hmm. Hey, I'm on your side. Look, if you don't win this election, Fat Freddy's going to be in that swivel chair, not me. Yeah. Hell, I'll be the first one to lose my job if you don't win. Mm. I think you're going to land on your feet regardless. No matter how this campaign comes out, you're going to be okay. No, no. If there's one thing I am, it's loyal. You gave me that job, and if you lose this election, I'll walk right out of that office. Oh. No. Um, plus, of course, Fat Freddy twists my arm to stay. That's what I thought. Well, look who's here. Hello, Hello Geraldine. Good. I'm so glad I got nice here before your flight left. You came all this way just to see me. Oh, I most certainly did. I told Raven I would if I got the chance. Uh, uh, Mrs. Saxon. Um, you're looking lovelier today than when we first met in uh, Logan's office. You uh, remember my associate, Cliff Nelson? Oh, yeah. How do you do? Very well, thank you, now that you're here. I spotted you as soon as you walked in the airport. Of course, everybody in Monticello knows you. I bet everybody in Washington knows you, too. Uh, although you haven't been there for quite a while. No, not in some time. In any case, I told Raven that I would... Where is Raven? He's home in bed, unfortunately. What? Oh, uh, Mrs. Saxon, maybe you ought to uh, take her place on this trip. I bet you those hicks upstate would really flip if they knew that the famous Geraldine Saxon was on the speaker's platform. Hey, well, for heaven's sake, what's the matter? Is she ill? She's got a high fever. I told her to call a doctor if she's feeling any worse. You know how stubborn Raven is about things like that. Look, and I'm so sorry to hear about this. Uh, Mrs. Saxon, um, I've been an admirer of yours for quite some time now. In my opinion, your family is at least the second most influential political family in the country. Yes. Well, for heaven's sake, it seems to me there must be something I can do. Mm -hmm. What about the baby? No, Jamie's fine. He's over at the Scots. There's just nobody to take care of Raven. That's what concerns me. I think I should call her. Uh oh Maybe I can help in some small Cliff, way. Please. Uh, no, I think it would be better if, if I went over there to see her. That's would you like that? what I was going to suggest. Let me give you the key to the apartment just in case she's asleep and doesn't hear the doorbell. Logan, what an awful time for her to get sick. No. I, I hope this isn't going to interfere now with this campaign tour. I, I have an idea. Um, why don't I take Logan's place on this tour, and that way you can go home and uh, take care of Raven. Well, what would you do in all those thick towns? Well, uh, for you, boss, I'd make the sacrifice. Mm -hmm. uh, besides, I love greasy chicken dinners. Uh, Logan, you worry about the campaign. I'll take care of Raven. Thank you so much. I'll call you as soon as I get there. Bye, Cliff. Bye, boss. Guthrie. What, did you come over here to thank me for saving your life? Forget it. It was an accident. Well, I really didn't think you cared whether I got shot or not. But in case you didn't remember me saying it last night, thank you. You're not welcome. I had another reason for dropping by. I was down at headquarters. Chief Marceau wanted me to bring back your gun. Great. You just put it right in the case. Aren't you going to keep it behind the bar anymore? The place is going to be closed. Closed? Yeah, Mr. Dorn figures we should close for a while till this cools off. Still smells like gunpowder. You notice? Yeah, you're quite a shot. Must be quite a marksman. Think I ought to try out for the cops? Oh, by the way, where'd you get the gun? I already told the cops where I got it. I bought it. Oh, that's right, Chief Marceau. You said you got it from a man named Jones. That's right. I didn't care what the guy's name was. The price was right. How much you pay for it? Oh, Guthrie, I don't have to answer any questions from you. You're not a cop anymore. You remember? Yeah, I remember. I remember why I quit, too. Public uproar, because I shot a 14-year-old kid carrying a toy gun. I'm glad you still remember what you did. I think my memory isn't so good, though. Meaning what? Meaning that gun of yours. It looks very familiar. Excuse me. I gotta lock up. Tell me something, Mickey. Did you buy the gun or did Joy? The unicorn is now officially closed. I'm on vacation, so why don't you just get the hell out of here? Let Guthrie. me ask you another question, Mickey. How come Joy kept a toy gun? He was a 14-year-old teenager. He was real attached to it. Is that why you switched it? With the real one he was carrying? You know, it's really a damn shame that I'm such a good shot.
trouble. I don't like being here. It's, uh... Come into your bedroom. <laughs> You've never been in another woman's bed before. <laughs> you know, we should have gone to that motel. Oh, as stuck as it was, at least we could have been on our own. We are on our own. And it's very safe and very comfortable. And besides, it's very practical. I come. Because I'm supposed to be very ill with a raging fever. <laughs> and as soon as my husband gets to the first tacky hotel on this campaign tour, he's going to call me up and want to know how I am. Oh, I see. So the sick, dutiful wife has to answer the phone, right? That's right. It's the way it has to be. You weren't quite as ingenious as I. I told Margaret I was going up to this fishing lodge <laughs> that didn't even have a phone. Well, you're a man. You can give an excuse like that. I can't. And besides, I think you ought to congratulate me on my excuse. Did I tell you about my temperature? What about it? <laughs> Logan wanted to know my temperature, so I took the thermometer when he wasn't looking and stuck it in a cup of hot tea. <laughs> Brave, and you're yes. a very naughty girl. Yes, I am a very naughty girl. And I have a very high fever. to have made a remarkable recovery. Earlier today, you were in the throes of a very nasty virus. Yes, well, a couple of hours in bed with you. You have the magic. <laughs> <laughs> I only wish you thought of a different arrangement. I mean, I don't mind being with another man's wife, but to be in that man's very own bed is a bit awkward, you know. That's funny. You haven't acted like it bothered you. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was perfect. Well, I suppose you would. What do you mean by that? I mean, a lot of women uh, like uh, the excitement of all the sneaking around in their affairs. That is why I thought uh, me being here would give you quite a thrill. <laughs> I'm not lying here to be psychoanalyzed. <laughs> said Logan was in Center City. He is. At least he's supposed to be. Raven, it's Geraldine. Are you in there? Are you all right? How'd you get in? Well, my dear, I didn't pick the lock. Logan gave me a key. Did he send you to check up on me? Yes, he did. I went to see him off at the airport. He told me you weren't feeling well and that you were unable to make the trip. Look, all sick people need is a little quiet and rest. Can't I do any shopping for you and bring you anything? No, will you just go away? This. I'll try to get back. Raven, you didn't have to get out of bed. I could have come in to you. No, the place was a mess. I didn't want you to see it. Besides, it's so full of germs, I didn't want you to catch anything. Well, that's very thoughtful of you. Look, I'm sorry, but I'm just all stuffed up, and I don't feel very well. I, in fact, I'm in a rotten mood. 
I say, you look remarkably well, wearing makeup. Well, I had to put something on. I look so pale. Did you have anything to eat? No, I don't have an appetite. Well, I think I should fix you something. Something light, maybe just toast and eggs. No, look, Where's Geraldine, I don't need anything. All I really want to do is just go back to bed. What is this doing here? Um, Logan and I were drinking that. We were just celebrating his first campaign tour. This bottle is still chilled. Is it? Oh, still not tidying up after Logan, I see. Geraldine, I told you I don't feel very well. This doesn't look like one of Logan's coats. Well, it is. Raven. Is there something burning in your bedroom? No, there... Geraldine, you can't go in there. Good evening, Mr. Saxon. I thought it would be gauche of me to hide in the closet. I rather wish you had. Geraldine, look, you don't understand. No, you're wrong, Raven. I understand perfectly. So what are you going to do? Go run and call Logan so he can come here and throw his wife out the window? I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to do. Well, I'll tell you what you can do. You can mind your own damn business. Look. Don't ruin my marriage. Please don't tell Logan. No. I'm not going to tell Logan. It would break his heart. And I'm not going to be the one to inflict that kind of pain on Logan. You're a very kind woman. Do I have your word? Because if you say one word to him, your precious little family of me and Jamie and Logan and you is finished. Do you understand that? If I lose my husband, Jamie loses his grandmother. If you say one word, you will never see your precious little boy again. You could have been a bit gentle with her. She had no right to come barge in on us like that. Oh, I knew it was a bad idea for us to meet here. Look, I don't want to listen to a broken record. <laughs> Did you see the look on her face when she saw you sitting in... <laughs> I thought she was going to have a stroke. I knew I shouldn't have let you talk me into coming here. <laughs> Stop it. You're depressing me. I think it, that it's hilarious. <laughs> April, I'm home. Yeah, I'm over here. Come on in. About time. Draper? <laughs> Yeah, well, I was afraid I might not recognize her. I mean, it's been a long time since oh, I've very seen funny. Hi. Hi. I told you it was going to be a long day. Yes, well, no one can ever accuse you of stretching the truth. Mm, supper ready, I'm starved. Two hours ago, have a seat. Uh, how's the kid? Oh, Jamie? Yeah. He's just fine. Absolutely adorable. Oh. We, uh, watch, it's all hot. We, um, Missy built the castle with his building blocks, and then we took a long walk to the park, and we uh, went to visit my mother, business, and then the two of us took a nice long nap. Well, I wish I could have been here for the nap anyway. Yeah, well, come on, you have to admit it was really nice for Margot to give me some free time so I could uh, watch Jamie. And I was almost sorry to put him to bed. As much as I uh, love my job at MON, I have to admit it's kind of fun playing mommy and playing with a little baby. How was your day? Well, first thing this morning, Logan came by and picked up Jamie's adoption papers. Good. I think it's about time that Logan be recognized as Jamie's legal father, considering he's his natural father. Well, as soon as Raven signs the papers, that's going to be straightened out. You went to court today, too, didn't you? Mm-hmm. I, uh, talked to Mr., what's his name, Mr., uh, Powers about his negligent suit. Then I went back to my office and prepared my calendar for tomorrow. 
Draper, you're taking on too much. Well, the way it looks now, it's not going to get any better tomorrow, either. Honey, look, you can't keep up this pace indefinitely. You're putting in too many hours. You're taking on too much work. Let's go through this again, all right? I told you before. The average person who needs legal help... Cannot afford it. Right. So in order to get more money, I've got to have more clients. Simple as that. Draper, we're both... We're both making very decent salaries. We're, we're not starving. Mm -hmm. Well, who says we need a lot of money? I see. And you know why. Draper, I have already told you I admitted what I did was wrong, and the only reason Margot did what she did was to see that we had a nice home. April, this is not my home. I mean, I, I get very little pleasure out of living here. I'm not going to get any until I give Margot her $35,000 back. I understand that. There is something you could give Margot right now that would mean a lot more to her than a personal check. I'll tell you what I'd like to give Margot, but I'd probably be arrested Oh, come for on, it. cut it out. I'm serious. Draper, all you have to do is give Margot a little kindness, a little understanding. Draper, all Margot wants from you is that you like her. How do you want me to like Margot? Hey, Draper, why don't you ask me to do something easy, like uh, ski down Mount Everest? Oh, come on. I'm not asking all that much. By the time I'm able to like Margot, I'll probably be able to pay her $70,000. Draper, Margot doesn't want our money. But it's Margot's attitude that her money can buy anything, including affection. Well, hell, April, you're a prime example of that. Look what she's done. She takes care of your every want. April wants a house. Margot buys your bro house. Margot, April wants a job. Margot gets April a job. And look at your salary. I, I, I think that, that Margot doesn't feel good enough to, to believe that people can, excuse me, care about her for herself. I mean, that's why she goes to all that trouble. Gives these gestures uh, to, to make sure people people love her and yeah her, her money can buy things but it can't buy my feelings my affection and the sooner she learns that the better off we're all going to be but draper i, I don't believe margot means any harm but she is harmful april i mean the way she goes about trying to get love i mean it's dangerous strong word yeah yeah it is but considering the lengths that she goes to i think it fits CBC Toronto, Channel 5, Cable 6. I've kept this in my drawer ever since the day you walked in and handed it to me, Steve. I figured you would want it back someday. That's why I always kept it handy. Thank you, Chief. I can't tell you how it feels to have it back again. You know, it's funny. The guys in the forest, they all call this a hunk of ten, potsy. Mm -hmm. But when it comes down to it, I think we all feel the same about it. I know what you mean. That's how I feel about my own potsy and have for the past 30 years, and I guess I will until they put me out to pasture. There is one thing I regret, though, Steve. What's that, Chief? That I can't give you a citation because you weren't a member of the force during this Page Madison business. You deserve one, though. You saved that girl's life. It was a job, a civilian job. I got my reward. Yeah. I hope you don't miss the money. Well, it's not the money, Chief. It's the fact that Paige Madison got through this mess alive. You knew those guns were defective, and you didn't care. You knew it, and you didn't give a damn. Honey, listen to me. It's the end result that counts, right? Oh, right, Toby. Well, this is the end for me. Hey, don't be in such a hurry, Paige. Just, just give it some thought now. Try to see my side of it. You know what I think of your side? This is what I think of your side. Toby, what is this? Charles Nathaniel Jed Smith. Give me that. That's just the list of the people that were in the group. No, it isn't. It's a list of the people who tried to kill me, but they were killed instead. Toby, what are you trying to do? Kill off everybody so you have the money to yourself? Why was there a question mark next to my name? Because, Paige. I wasn't sure what I was going to do with you yet. Now I know. What do you mean? I really didn't want to see you killed. But if they got to you first, that was going to be the chance I had to take. I really hate to be the last assassin.
for a piece of equipment that I think you might need, Steve. Thank you, Chief. You know, I feel a lot different about uh, this equipment now that I know the truth about Mickey Giles. Now that I know what he did to me the day I shot his brother. I still think there's something we ought to do about that, Steve. I mean, it was never an issue, you know, as far as the department was concerned. Even if the kid had been holding a cap pistol, you still acted properly. There was no way that you could have known the difference. It made a lot of difference to the public, to the press, to me. I mean, even though the department was behind me, I still couldn't handle the fact that I shot a kid who was carrying a toy gun. We know that it wasn't a toy, Steve. We know now that Mickey Dial switched those guns while you were out helping Deborah. Yeah, I know. I know for sure. But I still don't have any proof. Well, maybe something as good as proof would be a confession from Dials. Wait a minute. Do you think you're going to get a confession out of Mickey Dials? Maybe, maybe not. But uh, we could apply a little pressure. Apply pressure? I thought rubber hoses were a thing of the past. <laughs> That's not what I mean, Steve. I was talking about that gun permit that he's got. I mean, let's face it, he did kill a man. Now, I know he saved your life in the process. But at the same time, he took the law into his own hands. Now, that might be construed as reckless endangerment. Chief, if I have anything to say about this, I would like to ask you not to do it. Let me do it. Let me apply the pressure to Mickey Dials. Strictly a personal basis. What Nothing kind of official. What kind of pressure do you have in mind? Friendly persuasion. What do you say? That's it. I'm only taking a few things, so I have to come back and get the rest later. Look, Logan, you might as well leave it all here, because you can stay in this apartment. You've got my phone number at the club. The only reason I'll be coming back here is to see Jamie. Wait, you don't understand. See, nobody's going to be here, and there's no sense in you paying two rents. What are you talking about? Well, while you were in there packing, I started thinking, and, uh, I'm moving. <sighs> You're what? Yeah, I hate this place, so I'm leaving. And now seems to be the right time to do it. Well, where are you moving to? Oh, I've got your attention now, haven't I? Well, come on, where are you going? I didn't know you cared about what happened to me. I care about my son. Ah, uh, yes, right. Well, a son goes with his mother, and wherever I go, Jamie goes. So what are you thinking of, moving in with Geraldine, is that oh, it? Oh, no. Not with that old bag. I told her she would never see Jamie again, and I meant it. Oh, why? Geraldine meant you no harm. She had nothing to do with anything. Geraldine wallowed in the whole situation. She's never had such a good little time in her life. So don't you stand up for her, counselor, because it's a losing proposition. Jury has already decided. My God, are you cruel. You really enjoy it, don't you? And I think you enjoy cruelty more than sex. <laughs> Logan. Geraldine will never see Jamie again, and neither will you. What's that? You heard me. But I think you better say it again anyway. Now, I know you think I have no rights to Jamie because Kevin is on record as being his legal father, but it's not that cut and dry. So what are you going to do, take me to court? Yes, if I have to. Well, I hope you know a little something about the British law system. The British law system? Yes. I wonder if Ansel Scott will be my attorney. I bet he will. Did you know that my stepfather always had a thing for me? Shooting off your mouth again, huh? Uh-uh. Not only am I leaving this apartment, but I'm leaving the country. Isn't that great? Jamie will just love being in another country. You can't do that. But I've already phoned London. I'm waiting for the call from the operator right now. I thought you didn't like England. I thought your mother greeted you with the enthusiasm she would a case of the chicken fox last mm. time you were there. But I didn't have Jamie the last time. When I walk off that plane with that darling little boy in my arms, she'll change her attitude right away. You can't take my son out of this country. What are you going to do to stop me? Nothing. I'll let immigration do that. You haven't got a passport for him, have you? Huh? And while you're getting one, I'll get an injunction. 
Now, I don't want to drag our cesspool of a marriage into court, but I will if I have to. And I will prove that I am his natural father if I have to. So you remember that, and don't do anything stupid. Because I'm going to fight you, Raven, wherever you are, with whatever it takes. Sooner or later, he's better off sooner, I guess. Sooner? Come on, Draper, they've only been married about six months. Probably feels like six years. April, I really feel awkward talking about this in front of him. What? I mean, they are his parents. Oh, well, I'll put him up to bed so he doesn't uh, start any gossip, okay? Very funny. He is so adorable. Mm -hmm. You know what? I think he loves me. Doesn't everybody? Seriously, look at the way he looks at me, huh? <laughs> the way he wraps his little chubby fingers around my pinky at times, huh? You know, Raven, it's a horrible thing to say, but you've seen her with Jane. I mean, she doesn't have any patience. She hasn't given this little fella a chance to love her. <laughs> Raven doesn't want to be loved. She wants to be adored and worshipped. Yeah, well, you should know, huh? I mean, you were once one of her worshippers. Hey, come on, give me a break. Everyone's entitled to one mistake. She's sad. She's so sad. She doesn't know how lucky she is. To be a mother? Have a little baby like this to cuddle any time she wants? A baby who happens to be the most beautiful baby in the whole world, huh? <laughs> Speaking comparatively, of course. I mean, what other kids that age do you know? Oh, come on, how many do I have to know? I know Jamie. And I love this little fella so much, I could eat him up. <laughs> yeah, well, I hope you're not spreading the story around. What story? You know, the one we were just talking about. I know you went to see Margo today. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming you talked about it. Well, we didn't talk too long. No, we were interrupted by a surprise visit. Who? From whom? Elliot came home. I told you he went on a fishing trip. Oh, that's right. They closed the unicorn down for a couple of days, didn't they? Since mm -hmm. the shooting. Yeah, well, he's supposed to be gone till the end of the week. And there he was, home after just one day. Oh, I must said something about uh, that there were no fish. You know how I felt about his going on that trip. I thought for sure the last thing in the world he was going to do was go fishing, at least for fish. Did you think he was going to go in for another sport? In an indoor sport? Absolutely. You want to know something else? Margot thought so, too. Why? Well, the other day Margo and I did have a long talk. We talked about her marriage. Draper, she knows Elliot can't be trusted. Well, she's putting up with it, April. Oh, it was sad. It was sad to hear her talk about how she felt it was necessary to give him a long leash, as she referred to it. So people can make any kind of arrangements they want to make in their private yeah. lives. Look, if they have an open marriage and it's working for them, why should we judge well, Draper, it? Draper, that's, that's just the point. Margot doesn't consider it an open marriage. Look, I know you're going to find this very hard to believe, but... Draper, she is in love with that creep. I know it makes me sick to think of how that. That's, that's why she said she's, she has to tolerate his antics, or she's afraid she'll lose it. Oh, April, you got to know that marriage is coming all shapes and sizes these days. Yeah, marriages break up in all shapes and sizes, too, don't they? Mm. Come on, little fella. I think it's about time that we hit the old sack. What do you say? Come on, sweetheart. I just put him up to bed. You said you wanted to stay here. Hey, don't look so worried. I didn't come here to take my little angel away. I came here to leave him for good. <laughs> oh, boy, if you two could see your faces right now, I don't know whether you're happy or sad you look so stunned. Well, uh, yeah, I am. I, I can't imagine what you mean. I mean exactly what I said. 
Aren't you happy? Honey, you've always told me how much you love my little boy. What's the matter? You just love him if he's only here a couple of hours. Now, take it easy, Raven. You're three feet off the ground. You've been drinking or what? Oh, I need a drink. I'm going on a plane and they petrify me. Well, say something. Do you want to take him or don't you? Because if you don't, I'll have to find somebody else. Now, I'm sure Geraldine Saxon would give me her millions if I would bundle up the little kid and give him to her, but I wouldn't do that for all the tea in China. Or I should say London, that's more appropriate. Come on, Raven, I don't, uh, don't make jokes about this. It isn't funny. I'm not making a joke. As a matter of fact, I don't have much of a sense of humor these days. That's one thing I hope I get back when I leave this horrid place. Now, where are you flying? <laughs> You're not listening, Draper. I'm going to London. I've already got a ticket. I had a hard time, but there was a cancellation on the midnight flight, so I shall be flying across the Atlantic at midnight. Isn't that romantic? Why are you doing this? Oh, I think you know. I just have to get away from this dull, boring, ridiculous domestic life. I hate it. And I didn't realize how much I hated it until Logan started this damn quarrel. So it was Logan who started, huh? <laughs> Come on, Draper. I'm not going to clue you in on all the juicy details, even though I'd like to. No. I have to leave, and I haven't even packed yet, and it took me two days to pack on this trip upstate. And you never did take the trip upstate, did you? I mean, you were sick. Yes, well, I'm a lot better now. Matter of fact, I've never felt better in my life because I know exactly what it is I want to do now. And the first thing I'm going to do is give Jamie to a brand new mommy. You. My God. Raven, you're serious. Uh-huh. And I'll show you just how serious I am. I have it all written out. Now, this may not be the most perfect legal document in the world, Draper, so you might want to look it over and improve it a little bit, but essentially, it gives you and April all rights to Jamie's care, feeding, and upbringing. Anything you want to do with him is just fine with me. Just for good measure, I signed this, too. Now, this is a copy of the consent agreement that you wanted me to sign for Logan, giving him the right to adopt Jamie. Well, you can just forget that, because I've scratched out his name and put yours and April's in his place. You're insane. Now, look, you don't have to adopt him. I just did this because I thought it might help in case people question this little arrangement. But, eventually, if you do want to adopt him, then it's all settled. Raven, you can't just... Give away your baby like this. Can't I? Can't abandon your little boy. I'm not abandoning him. I'm doing him a favor. I'm just giving him a mommy who loves him. And you do love him, don't you? Yes, I do. There, you see. Besides, even if I did bring him to London, my mother would love him for a little while, but... Eventually, having Jamie and I around would just be like an announcement to the world that she was a grandmother, and oh boy, mother would hate that. Yeah, as much as you hate being a mother. Raven, this is sick. You just can't dump your kid like a bag of potatoes. She wants him. Will you look at her face? Now look. I mean, if I'm wrong, then I'll just go upstairs and bundle up the little booger and give him to somebody else. No! Can't do that, Raven. They're going to be wonderful parents. You know, I always thought it was a crime that a lovely couple like you two couldn't have children of your own. So, now you have one. You've got what you want, I've got what I want. What do you want? I want to fly. Oh. <laughs> but not on a plane, no, no. See, I want wings of my own. That's why I, I call myself Raven. See, I was the one that took that name uh, when I was a little girl. My real name. Charlotte. <laughs> Can you imagine? But anyway, one day I was sitting on the lawn and I saw this beautiful black bird with shining wings fly by. Oh, I wanted to be that bird. It was so beautiful. So free. With beautiful black wings.
are you doing here, Guthrie? Would you come to thank me for saving your life? I already did that. I want to ask you a few more questions. Oh, gee, I'm sorry. I got no time. Yeah, where are you going? Don't tell me they fired you at the unicorn. No. I figured it was a good time to move on to some new opportunities. Now, look. I don't have to answer any civilian questions. Am I right? That's right. But I'm not a civilian anymore, Mickey. I'm back on the force. I decided quitting was a mistake, especially for such a lousy reason. I think killing a 14-year-old kid is a hell of a good reason. Self-defense. I had to shoot him before he shot me. With a cat pistol. With a real gun. The same gun you killed Zach with. The same one your brother had in his hand. Now, I know it and you know it. And I think it's time that other people knew it, Mickey. Yeah, well, just send me a letter, okay? Now, get out of my way! What the hell is this? Look how it builds. Yeah, but just give me that, man. It's mine. There must be more to Mickey Dials than meets the eye. What are these tips from the unicorn? Must be a million bucks here. You count pretty fast, this thing. You know, I didn't think I was going to take you down to headquarters for questioning, but I think that's a pretty good idea. I'm not going anywhere with you, cop. Go on fire. Fire away, Mickey. What the hell is this? The talk! Damn it! I switched it. Same way you switched it on me. I hope you appreciated the joke. Well, you're a real funny guy, Guthrie. Yeah, well, the real one's down at headquarters, and that's where we're headed. <sighs> okay. Okay, great. Let's go to headquarters. You got nothing on me. Hold it, Mickey! You've got nowhere to go. Bonesteel and his special guest, actor David McFarlane, who suffers from Down syndrome, on Man Alive, tomorrow night on CBC. Sleepy. Let him go to sleep. Oh, he's not that sleepy. He took a nap this afternoon. So did I. I'm not surprised. You were up half the night. Oh, come on. Oh, well, April, half a dozen bad. times you got up because you thought you heard Jamie. Well, now I feel fine. As a matter of fact, I feel wonderful. Guess what I did this afternoon? I took Jamie's playpen outside and filled it up with all his toys, and then I took a nap in the hammock. It's almost as if he knew I needed a little rest. Well, why don't you return the favor and put him up in his crib? Because I promised him he could play with his new daddy today. Well, his, his new, new daddy, for Pete's sake, Oh, come April. on, Draper, you know what I mean. He might as well think of you as his father if he's going to be living here. Come on, he's only seven months old. Do you expect me to teach him how to say, Uncle Draper? I suppose you're calling yourself Mommy. It's only natural. No, isn't? April, it's not natural. It's neurotic. It's neurotic as hell, April. You're not the boy's mother. Do you understand that? Do you? You're not Mommy, and I'm not Daddy. You're going to upset Jamie. No, April, I'm the one who's upset. Look, I'm sorry if you had a hard day. You bet I had a hard day. Mike told me about your visit. All I could think about all day, April, was you here at home, acting as if everything was decided because Raven gave us one lousy piece of paper. Well, if you'll Suddenly excuse we're... Excuse me, I think I've changed my mind. It is time for Jamie yeah, to go Yeah, you put to Jamie bed. to bed, April, but we're not going to forget about it. 
Trevor, I haven't forgotten about him for one minute. Come on, baby. You want to come considering the family he came from. Oh, you know, we're just so lucky, April. You know, here we are living in a brand new house, which we can't afford. We're taking care of a brand new baby that doesn't Listen belong to, to us. God knows it's going to drop from the heavens him. now. Look, I expected you to come home here tonight with all sorts of arguments. But I'm not going to get excited. And I hope that you at least can discuss this calmly, too. All right. I'm glad we're so unemotional this evening. It's got nothing to do with emotions. You happen to be a lawyer, and I thought that you would appreciate the logical approach. Drayford, look. I know that what Raven did does not make us immediately Jamie's parents. I think for the time being, we should just settle for legal guardianship. Oh, now, first things first, right? That's right. And Jamie does come first. That's the way the court would look at it, and I think that's the way we should look at it, too. Well, well, why don't you tell me what you think is best for Jamie? Since he doesn't have a mother anymore... But he does have a father. Yes, he does have a father. But for all intents and purposes, Logan is now a single man. A single man with a very, very important wait career. Wait a minute, wait a minute. What about your career? I thought you were going to be a television executive, or maybe, maybe a, a TV personality. I mean, you interview people so well. My career can wait for a while. As of today, I've taken a leave of absence from WMOA. You what? That's right. I'm not quitting my job. I'm just taking a leave of absence. Just until Jamie... Until Jamie is older. Until he's, he's married and has kids of his oh, own. Oh, would you stop being so ridiculous? Of course I know mothers have, have children and careers, What too. about L Logan can take care of his own this child? This has nothing to do with Logan. April, you... stop this! Now! It's enough. Draper, don't you want a family? Draper, you were the one who talked about adoption. Now we don't have to adopt. We don't have to worry about where the, where the child came from, who his parents are. We have a child. A child that we know. A child that I happen to already love. Draper, please. Please don't do this to me. Look, look at me. We have a baby upstairs. Jamie is ours. He's asleep in our bedroom. He'll be there tomorrow morning. And we can love him, and we can raise him just like he was our own son. Please, don't take him away from me, Draper. Not now. Not if... Not if you love me, don't do this. <clears throat> you know, Logan, it's strange how responsible I feel for what Raven did. Almost as if she were my own child and I had raised her badly. Oh, Geraldine, you didn't do anything wrong. You just walked in on her at a bad time, that's all. If I could only withdraw the key from that locked door. I gave you that key, remember? I asked you to go by there and check on her health. It's certainly not your fault. By the time you arrived, she'd been cured by Dr. Dorn. Well, I didn't want you to know. I, I saw no point in telling you. You didn't. You didn't tell me anything. <clears throat> I came back because I was concerned about Raven. I thought she was sick. I don't know, maybe I picked up something from your tone of voice, but that's a long way from telling tales. I just wish there had been some other outcome. Not me. Tough as it is, I'd much rather know the truth. And what will you do now? Oh, the best thing. Get out of it. Get out of the marriage as quickly and cleanly as possible. Get custody of Jamie. You don't think there will be any problem there? She abandoned him. Practically left him on a doorstep. A familiar doorstep, I grant you that. Yes, but how will you manage? I mean, without a wife, without someone to take care of Jamie? I haven't thought that far ahead. There are ways. Uh, you mean hiring someone? Mm -hmm. Mm hmm Like Mrs. Harris, yeah. who never seems to get off the phone long enough with her own children to take care of Jamie? Well, if not Mrs. Harris, then somebody else. I see. A long parade of paid mothers. Well, what happens when you have to travel? And you will in your job, you know. And all the late nights you spend working? Just to cross that bridge when we come to it. You got a suggestion? <clears throat> uh, well, uh, uh, as a matter of fact, yes, but I... 
I just don't know how it will strike you. Well, let's find out. Strike ahead. <laughs> it, it has occurred to me that you might be willing to um, combine forces. Do what? <laughs> I realize that you and I are a rather strangely matched pair, but then odd couples are rather common these days, aren't they? And we do have some things in common, you know. I mean, we're both victims in our own ways. Victims trying to hang on as survivors. Geraldine, are you su... <sighs> I don't know how to put this delicately. Are you suggesting that we combine households? <laughs> well, certainly I realize you don't need a mother at this stage in your life. But after all, I have been a grandmother to Jamie ever since he was born, and so far I haven't had any complaints from him. <laughs> Logan. Don't worry about hurting my feelings if you say no. no. I realize that I have become more and more superfluous as my life goes on. <laughs> Somehow I have been the residue of so many broken homes and broken marriages and death. Two husbands, two sons of my own. And then there was Kevin. He was my son, too, you know. I mean, I made him my son. And when Kevin married Raven, he started a chain of events that led right to this moment, this room, this conversation. A tired old woman and a sad young man. <laughs> no, Logan. I couldn't blame you for not wanting to put that combination together. Oh, no, I didn't say it was a bad idea. It's... Well, you know, I, I thought maybe I could be helpful in some way. Maybe even useful. <laughs> I, I don't know. Somehow, I just I can't see you as Jamie's permanent babysitter. Oh, well, I'm not applying for that job. <laughs> no. I'm applying for the job in a family. For you and Jamie. And me. You looked a little sad. But I can guess what's on your mind. It's your daughter, isn't it? No, as a matter of fact, I wasn't thinking about April just now. I was thinking about you. Oh, I'm flattered. I don't think you would be if you could read my mind. Uh-oh. Am I beginning to alarm me? Have I been uh, neglecting you lately again? Tell me where I've uh, done wrong. Matter of fact, that is precisely what someone else told me earlier today. Someone? Mm -hmm. Who? Oh, someone we both know very well. Someone who used to work right here, as a matter of fact. You don't mean Sarah Albright? Ah, precisely. Dear Sarah, drop by. Out of the kindness of her heart to tell me a few things she thought I ought to know about you. Something tells me you know exactly how the conversation went. I can't imagine. Oh, can't you? Well, Sarah Albright is a dangerous, demented woman. I was afraid she was going to pull a shabby trick like this. I was going to warn you about this a long, long time ago. Listen, uh, I might as well tell you the truth. Sarah didn't resign. I fired her. Oh. Or rather, I forced her to leave uh, by threatening to reveal what she was doing. Even to the extent of calling the police. The police? The woman was a petty thief, Margot. Oh. I caught her at it. That's why she's doing this. That's why she's going around saying that we had an affair behind your back. <laughs> she didn't say any such thing. Oh? 
she didn't say anything about the two of you. She said something entirely different. Yeah, of course, but I was just uh, using this as an example. That's the kind of thing she would say. I mean, that's well, the kind of thing It doesn't that... matter. I told her I wasn't interested in her gutter gossip. You did? Oh, it wasn't very pleasant hearing what she had to say, but then it could have been false. Or it could have been the absolute truth. I like Marco, L please. Let me finish, please. It could have been the absolute truth. But I told her I didn't want to hear about it. I told her that it wasn't any of her business, just as I said, it wasn't any of my business. Oh. Now, don't misunderstand. I was very hurt by what she said, more hurt than I thought I could be, but I was also protected by a certain decision that I'd made a long, long time ago. Do you have any idea what I'm talking about? Look, Margo, I... I swear to you. I have never been unfaithful to you. Never. I know there have been stories, people always telling stories about other people. You know that. But you're the only woman I care about. Do you believe me? Do you expect me to? I want you to. Oh, well, that's different. Not that the different matters. Because the decision that I was talking about is the decision to make this marriage work, to believe that this marriage is as good as I can possibly expect it to be. Margo, you're an no, angel. No, Elliot, please. Don't touch me right now. I don't think I want to be touched right now. Margo. And let's not talk about it anymore, either. Do you understand? I don't want to have to talk about it anymore. Believe me, my angel, you wouldn't. You won't have to talk about this again. Ever. I don't want to do anything to lose you. I need you. Very much. I'll dress for dinner. I take my own advice all the time. I tell all my patients to come home to a beautiful wife. How's your day? Oh, it's a dumb question. Half of it's still ahead of you, isn't it? Oh, uh, well, one special thing did happen this afternoon. I heard a very interesting story. Huh. Margot might be at the studio tonight. I should ask her about it. What was it? April is leaving WMON. Are you kidding? She wouldn't do that for all the tea in China. Well, I don't know. Then she's uh, taking a leave of absence. Len told me about it. I tried to reach her this afternoon at home. She must have been shopping or something. Well, that's got to be some kind of a false rumor. Let's face it, Margot would never leave. You know, that job is too good a way of keeping the apron strings tied. <laughs> well, that's what I thought. But Glenn seemed pretty sure about it. Said April was talking to him about him taking on some of her work. Oh, good. Company. We eating in? Yes. Okay. Oh. Well, we were just talking about you. Oh, no, my ears are burning. Mm. Mm. Glad to see you home. Oh, I'm right. glad to see you. I'm going to wait until the night to find out what's going on. Yeah. Is Draper with you? Oh, uh, no, he's uh, at home with Jamie. You still have that baby with you? Yeah, as a matter of fact, we might uh, have him for quite some time. Ah, well, then that explains the rumor. You're just taking some extra days for babysitting. Yeah, and Nicole had heard that you were planning to leave the station. Neither one of us could understand why. Well, that's why I'm here, to tell you all about it. Um... Logan and Raven have split up for good. She has taken off for England and said that she would probably never, ever return. Well, it's Raven. I'm not surprised. Yeah, but that's not all. She left her baby with us, and I don't just mean to babysit. I mean to keep, to take care of and treat as our own son and to adopt if we want to. Well, I can't believe that Raven would do something it's true. like that. It's true. She left papers, legal papers, papers giving us permission to care for Jamie, and even uh, adoption consent forms in case we want to adopt him. Well, look, it, it makes sense to me. Raven knows that we love Jamie, and we're both young. We've got a beautiful new home. I can't have any children of my own, and Logan is not 
Jamie's legal parents. Look, even if he was, he, he's in no position right now to make a well, home for Jamie. Slow down a little bit. You're going 60 miles an hour, and I think you're off the track a bit. Look, what I... I'd really like you to help me make Draper understand. Like said, if we went to court, they would choose in favor of the baby, whatever's best for the baby. And don't you think that staying with us is the absolute best for Jamie? I don't know, April. I've never heard of anything like this happening well, before. Well, look, I'm upset. I'm worried about Draper. He was extremely unreasonable tonight. He acted as if, as if I were committing some sort of crime. When all I want to do is raise and, and love a, a little baby boy. Oh, you've got to understand. I mean, I mean, you've got a little boy of your own. What if we were talking about Adam? What if we were talking about Adam and it was Miles who was giving you a hard well, time about... Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. You leave me out of this. this the situation's not the same. Look, I, uh, I really don't have any time to argue. I just... I just wanted to come by and tell you what was happening because I'm sure that Draper is going to call you and try to enlist your help in... Making me reasonable, you see. Well, being reasonable is not such a bad idea. No, but being happy is a lot better idea, Miles. Gotta go. Think for all. Yeah. What's the matter? You forget your key? Good evening. Swifty. What are you doing here? Come on in. The sooner the three of us got this thing settled, the better off we'd be. Well, you, the only problem is April's not here. Well, maybe that's for the best. I really need to get this off my chest anyway. Would you sit down and let me talk at you for a while? I told you I would tell you about the breakup eventually. You know, why it happened, if you haven't already guessed. I should have. I should have figured it out a lot sooner than I did. After all, I had the example of the way Raven carried on with me when she was married to Kevin. Husband didn't mean very much to Raven, I don't think. He was just a conquest, past history, boring. Needed new worlds to conquer. Well, I guess I don't have to draw you a picture. Anyway, when I found out the truth, when I walked in on the truth, there wasn't much left for Raven to do except throw a fit, which she did. As soon as she found out she couldn't manipulate me the way she did Kevin. I think that's what really got to her, you know? So she did the only thing that... She was sure it would hurt me. She took my son away from me, and he's my son. I know he's your son, Logan. I only have one question. I mean, Jamie's a, a tiny baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How are you going to take care of him? So I've already made arrangements for that. <laughs> Geraldine's going to take charge. We're combining forces. Uh, so <laughs> whatever forces we have. I don't know how it's going to work out. I don't know much about the future at all. I just know I want my son. We'd have some leftovers something. I'm going to check Jamie's. No, wait, April, don't go upstairs. It's not here. I know. But where is he? With his father. What's that supposed to mean? It means that Logan came by when you were gone. And he wanted his baby, so I gave him to him. So you just gave it to him? Just like that, huh? Why? You had no right, Draper. You had absolutely no right. How could you do it to me? <laughs> through Friday on the CBC network station. The Edge of Night originates with ABC. The work. Well, it's about time for me to leave and see how Mr. Desmond is taking care of things at the Unicorn. 
It was Mr. Desmond. Oh, he's the new bartender. Replacing the late, uh, Mickey Dial. Well, let's just hope he doesn't turn out to be a criminal like the late Mr. Dial. Now, now, Margo. Don't go into one of those I told you so routines. That wouldn't be like the Margo I know and love. Don't worry, darling. I have no intention of doing that. The unicorn is your business. You run it as you see fit. Why am I? We have come a long way, haven't we? Yes, we've come a long way. April? What are you doing here? Well, Margo, um, Elliot, I didn't expect we'd still be here. That's okay, April. I was just about to leave. Thanks for bringing up the elevator. I wonder if there's a bad about leaving Margo alone now, now that she has uh, good company. Enjoy yourself. Good night. Well, what's the matter? It's a horrible thing in my life that's happened tonight. What? I can't believe he'd do it. In any case, I've left Draper. I've left him and I may never go back. I mean, he just gave him away. He just handed him away as if, as, if, as if what I felt didn't even matter. No, wait just a minute, darling. I don't understand what you're saying. Draper has given Jamie back to Logan. What? I went out. I went out earlier to go shopping. At least that's what I said I was doing. I went over to Nicole and Miles' house to tell them how unreasonably Draper has been acting and to try to get them to help me convince Draper. No, wait, wait, wait. Just a minute, darling. Uh, sit down over here. Calm yourself and tell me everything that's happened step by step. Come on. I got back to the house, and the crib was empty. It was empty. <laughs> I took one look at that crib, and I felt like, I felt like my, my whole inside had just been torn out of my body and draped. Well, he just stood there. He just stood there looking like a wounded deer, as if he expected sympathy from me. Come on, darling. I'm sure Draper didn't do it just, just to be mean. I mean, he's a lawyer. He probably figures that there are laws. Sure he does, and they're all on Logan's side. I have absolutely no right. What I, what I think, what I feel, and what I need doesn't, doesn't, doesn't mean a damn. I can't believe I'm, I'm saying these things about my own husband. Darling, there are lots of things that you've never admitted about Draper. There were... Look, let's just uh, talk this out very calmly. I'm sure it's not as bad as you think. It can't get worse. He is against keeping Jamie. He didn't want that baby from the moment that Raven stepped into that room with those papers, those legal papers, those signed papers, the adoption papers. Darling, that sounds as though you have some sort of legal right. What difference does it make? He doesn't want him. I know that now. I also know that he... That he never meant it when he talked about adoption. That was said for my benefit, to, to appease me. He just figured I'd, I'd forget about the whole entire thing. Well, everyone knows there's no such thing as paternal instinct, is there? But I love Jamie. And Draper knew that. God knows I've loved that baby like he was my own. He spent more time with me than he has with his own mother. Well, look, it's obvious that his own mother doesn't want him, but you have to be realistic, darling. Logan Swift has certain claims. Then let him child. prove it. He's a... You know, I don't want with a 36-month GMAC smart lease.